you're all here to see uh, safe investment cybersecurity as a catalyst of business transformation. My name is Kate Burnett Isaacs. I'm uh, the director of data science at Infrastructure Canada. Don't worry, you're not here to see me. I am just your moderator today. Um, so I want to introduce our four panelists uh, here. Um, I'll do a very brief introduction um, and then get them to say some opening remarks. Um, and then uh, I think we'll kick it off with uh, some questions. Um, and I encourage everyone here uh, to pose questions. Uh, you have um, some brilliant minds in front of you uh, to pick their brains. Um, so first, to the left of me, I have Matt Davies, Chief Technology Officer of Shared Services Canada. And Duncan, Chief Information Officer, uh, Department of Energy, United States of America. Uh, Matthew Leach from Hewlett pa uh, Packet Enterprise. Uh, and Carl Hoods, uh, Group Chief Digital and Information Officer, Department of Energy Security and Net Zero, and Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, United Kingdom. Um, so I'm going to open it up to uh, Matt uh, as our first uh, speaker today. Thank you. Um, so Matt Davies, Chief Technology Officer, Shared Services Canada. I'm coming up on three years of being with Shared Services. I will continue to tell folks that it's been a fascinating journey. Um, I'm thrilled to be uh, at this event today. I very think, think it's incredible that we're having a discussion about cybersecurity, truly a global challenge, and we've got folks from around the world joining us today. So I think we're very fortunate to have uh, Anne and Carl here today, and, and Matt as well. Um, for me, Shared Services Canada, uh, just a little bit of background, you know, walking into it, somebody said Shared Services Canada, and I didn't truly appreciate what I walked into, but when you start to take a look at it, we're almost 10,000 people. That was, you know, when it was created in 2011, you know, it was put together to basically consolidate IT from the 43 different partner departments and try and get a common look and feel. And I think there is a, some financial benefit. So the CPA side of me feels like, okay, there might be some economies of scale with respect to that. Um, SSC launched in 2019 3.0, which is really trying to drive towards an enterprise view. And when I think about what we've been trying to accomplish from shared services, we want to make sure that we're providing all of our services to support our partner departments as they deliver services. And the complexity of our environment, because today we're talking about cyber, I'll go back to you have 43 different ways of doing things, and now you put it all together into one department. We have 4,000 you know, different, you know, network points, 5,000 different buildings. We have a run a, a network that spans the, the country and supports our, our global affairs, our D&D group as well. And you overlay just the sheer size and scale complexity, eight different public cloud you know, arrangements that we have in place. It is a vast, a vast attack surface. And we have to make sure that we've got a secure and resilient infrastructure in place to make sure that we keep things running to provide those services. It's truly been a fascinating uh, journey. And I look forward to the, the next couple of years. We continue to look for ways to improve our overall cybersecurity posture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so over to you, Anne. Great, thank you. So I want to start by just sharing a little bit about what the Department of Energy does because most people think they know and they don't. Um, so uh, we have uh, 97 sites in 27 states and our mission uh, spans from uh, uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation and maintain the nuclear stockpile and building replacement nuclear weapons to um, managing a bunch of programs that are designed to help with the energy transition. Uh, so, so grants and loans and research to drive the clean energy transition. Uh, we manage uh, uh, the uh, power grid in 36 states and we sell bulk power in those states uh, that are generated by other parts of the federal government. So we're a, a bulk power provider and a grid operator. Um, and then we have 17 national labs, which we consider to be the United States engine of innovation for uh, the success of, of new research across the US and around the world. So it's a, it's a huge mission um, and one that requires a great deal of, of coordination because obviously the needs of a Berkeley lab uh, that does open science are very different than the needs of a National Nuclear Security Administration manufacturing facility. So there's a lot of work we do that's very broad um, and uh, very differentiated across the portfolio. Um, as CIO, I'm responsible for not only uh, IT and, and technology modernization, but also cybersecurity. So 
the idea that uh, cybersecurity can in fact be an, an enabler of IT modernization uh, is an important concept uh, for us. It can at times be a forcing function uh, to say that that the technology needs to change because it is no longer no longer can be secured. Um, and those investments in cybersecurity can help us move towards modernization as well as simply making us more secure. Um, so we all agreed as a panel that we were going to try and, try and be brief and, uh, and get you questions. So I'm going to leave it at that and we'll talk a little bit more about what we do at DOE later. Thank you. It's over to you, Matthew. Uh, so my name is Matthew Leach. I have a really unimpressive title there. I work for Hewlett Packard <laughs> Enterprise. I'm actually the national chief technologist for the organization. I've been here for 28 years. And so I'm the vendor on the stage. So I sell solutions to these kind of folks as to well as all of you in the room. And what's of critical paramount to us at Hewlett Packard Enterprise is that we have to keep innovating, right? We cannot stay static. We have to continue to follow and be ahead of the trends to support the platforms that you are all are putting in place. So whether it be the Department of Energy, whether it be Shared Services Canada, whether it be in the UK government sector, we have to continue to push the envelope and stay current, not only for our well-being, but also for yours as well. If we don't continually innovate, then we will fall behind and you ultimately will put your solutions and systems at risk as you're referring to. We have to keep looking at the trends. We have to keep thinking how we can modernize and move forward. So I have an opportunity to talk to customers all across the country and really try to figure out how it is that we can position our solutions to help you guys move your own business forward with security being top of mind. We call ourselves the edge to cloud company. As your data is existing in different locations, you talk about different regions and different data centers and different sites, we have to be mindful of how you're stitching those solutions together. And if we don't do that, then we will fall behind and ultimately leaving your systems and your solutions at risk. So thank you for having me here. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So yeah, Carl. So uh, aside from vying for one of the longest job titles uh, in the world, which there's another bit to add on to that about integrated corporate services digital. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep going with that. So just uh, building on some of those points uh, and for context. So I'm responsible for all of our digital data and technology activity across those two departments. Uh, 13 other government organizations also buy my end user compute service. So we're kind of a small scale shared service. So that's why Matt and I are going to catch up later on about uh, some horror stories and war stories and some good tips on that side. But we've been through a kind of digital transformation journey for the last five and a bit years, uh, which has seen us move to a position which is slightly different to most other government departments in the UK. So for all of the stuff that we manage as a core team, and we won't get into the shadow IT problem, uh, we are fully cloud-based. We have no data centers uh, at all. We consume everything direct over the internet. Um, so we're in a slightly different position. So for us at the moment, having been through some of that journey and moving to zero trust, security posture, et cetera, for us, it's about continuous improvement and continuous investment. And really, I know the, kind of the, the topic is about how you secure that investment. Most of our jobs as CIOs and, and senior IT leaders is convincing other people to invest in something or do something. Um, and that's what we're increasingly seeing ourselves do more and more, always try to explain why it's important that just because we've been through a transformation doesn't mean we can take your foot off the gas. This kind of lumpy investment cycle that we see often invest because there's a problem, we fix the problem, let's move on to the next problem. We've got to flatten that out so that we've got continuous investment in my, in my mind anyway. Right. Well, thank you. Um, so very interesting um, backgrounds and, and discussion topics to launch of. Um, certainly, uh, Matt and Anna, what stood out to me was the breadth um, and uh, you know size of the organizations that you're you're trying to oversee and help um, manage. Uh, you know, from well, all fronts, but cybersecurity in particular. And then um, for Carl and Matthew, your sort of notions of innovation um, and continuous improvement and what. You know, how does that work um, and shape the cybersecurity space? Um, so I think it's now time for questions. Um, I will start for questions from uh, the audience. So we do have a couple microphones here. Um, so I invite uh, those with questions to stand up. So maybe I'll... I'll get things started with a quick, oh, uh, oh, I do see a question. We've got to wait the full 10 seconds, so please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Andrew Mugoya. I'm from the UK. I'm one of the partners for GGF. 
Um, I guess my question is around cyber. For a long time, cyber is seen as this almost reactive department where it goes, we protect the state from, you know, from external bad actors. But considering, you know, quantum computing is on the horizon, you've got AI, you know, how much are you looking to the horizon to see, you know, just rather than waiting for that reality to happen, starting to prepare for that in a, almost in a change of paradigm as to how you look at security as opposed to just protecting the perimeter to thinking, how do we make sure that cyber is, I guess what I have in mind is if you think cyber is protecting the state, but with AI, you have people who, the people inside their state might not even know who they're speaking to, for example. So it's it's a whole different, it's not necessarily they've gotten into the into their state, they've gotten into people's heads because I think I'm speaking to someone, but I'm not actually speaking to someone, I'm speaking to an avatar. So how is, you know, what are your thoughts on how cyber is starting to think about those changes and, and, and how it reacts to that? Sure. Uh, so you touched on a couple of different areas. So artificial intelligence, um, quantum, I'll, I'll hit on both of those too, because I think I've had more conversations in the last three to four months on generative AI and quantum computing. And I'm, I, I think if I look back, um, in all of the industry discussions, I can see trends. When John Kinderweg came out with Zero Trust, immediately all the products were now Zero Trust enabled. Then AI came out and a lot of products were now AI enabled. And now I'm having discussions with industry partners about quantum safe solutions. So I feel like, and, what, and how they're embedding generative AI into their products and or their service offerings. So I think for, for me on the cyber front, Industry is very quick at responding. And from a government perspective, we are also trying to be very quick at responding and understanding how those technologies are going to play in to improve our overall cyber defense posture. And I think going back to the, the you know, can we be a catalyst for business transformation? Absolutely. Those technologies and us understanding how they can help us and with the en engagement with industry partners. So I'll make a comment about HPE folks like, talking about trends. Our industry partners are trying to bring the technologies to the forefront for us and to see whether or not we can apply them to help improve our overall posture moving forward. So we are having those discussions on those emerging technologies. There's no easy solution. When I think about the quantum safe discussions, there's not one industry partner has come out and said, oh, actually, we solved that. That was last year's problem. We don't have that problem anymore. That's done. We're now moving on to the next thing. We're not there yet. Yeah, there was a ton of stuff in that question. Um, so I'll, I'll attack a little different angle of that question. Um, and that is cybersecurity by design. Uh, so, you know, we, we can't uh, simply test, I mean, we've learned this, we can't test security into a system. Um, so uh, we started looking at cybersecurity by design in software, but I think re more recently we've realized that hardware is also a place where we need cybersecurity by design. And specifically those systems that, you know, obviously there are no systems left that are hardware without software and firmware. So the ability to evaluate and understand what we're designing and building is, is hugely important. In fact, Idaho National Lab, which is one of our 17 national labs, has a program called Cyber Informed Engineering, which is actually about design principles to help people design um, hardware and software systems that are uh, designed with cybersecurity in mind so that those can be secure by design. And I think you know your, the, the points Matt made about uh, the next big thing are really important. These are, you know, zero trust. <clears throat> They're just because a vendor says you're zero trust enabled or you're, or you're AI enabled or you're quantum safe enabled doesn't mean you are, right? There is, as one of my colleagues says, there is no zero trust in a box. There isn't going to be AI in a box or, or uh, quantum safe computing in a box, right? None of those things are going to happen. Um, so the question is, is how do, we, how do we approach those solutions to ensure we're safe and secure? And certainly we are looking at all those things in the US government. Um, we have been looking at, at quantum computing and what our, what our risks are regarding um, uh, I don't know, quantum decryption uh, and how we create uh, quantum safe encryption going forward. And as you said, there are no real answers there yet. Uh, we're using 
everybody's using AI, uh, whether we want them to or not, as we as we discussed in the in the uh, session upstairs a little while ago. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, that we understand the rules of the road. So we're working on roadmaps and sandboxes for our folks in that space as well. And obviously, tremendous amount of work around zero trust. So I will leave it at that. Well, I think the, the term that you used about being reactionary to it, right? And I think that's where we're seeing customers are trying to be proactive. And all of these technologies and techniques that you're talking about, whether it be AI or quantum or whatever that happens to be, I think we're trying, the landscape needs to change to being less reactionary to the problems that are occurring and more proactive. So I think governance and policy and enforcement is the only way. And it has to come from the top down in terms of blessing or having a support structure from the senior leadership committing to having a plan for when things go off the rails. And I think you're seeing in small businesses, medium-sized businesses in Canada, they're struggling is they have not, they don't have a plan in place. So what happens when a cyber event occurs, they don't know. Companies are folding. There's large companies that are going under having negative implications to cyber attacks. I think the organizations need to have a proactive approach to cyber, admit it, admit that it's going to happen. It, I mean, I'm sure you guys have statistics on how many attacks are coming across your landscapes with your attack surfaces you have. We have to admit that it's there, acknowledge the problem exists, and start developing policies and procedures around it to deal with the inevitable, honestly. So I appreciate that. We really want to help customers, and we want all of our industries to transition that and acknowledge it and embrace that this has the new normal now as we move forward. Yeah, and I think in building on, on that as well, going back to the investment part, there's something about bringing that to life um, and you know it's collective responsibility cyber isn't just the you know kind of prevail of CIOs and CTOs right um, but trying to educate a board on something which can be quite ethereal right they don't really understand the mechanics of it um, I've been lucky and slightly unlucky outside of work I'm on the board of 54 schools across London and about 18 months two years ago they had a fairly large ransomware attack um, and the CEO phoned me up and said oh our CIOs just called me and said, we've had a ransomware attack. Should I be worried about this? And it was like, uh, probably should be. Where's your disaster recovery plan? Oh, oh. Um, I don't know. Let me ring him. Have you phoned NCSC? You know, have you been through this kind of process? The disaster recovery plan was in the CIO's head. So that didn't really kind of help uh, with getting, getting to grips with it. But going through and being able to explain to my boards the practicalities of the impact of that, um, even just some of the mechanics of you know, the incident response, having an expert negotiator on the dark web talking to people, you know, this kind of stuff happens and you think, well, unless you've experienced it, it's hard to bring it to life. So again, back to securing investment, there's nothing more impactful than a horror story uh, to make people sit up and, and wake up and take notice of it, which is something you can't do all the time. But I think, you know, the power of storytelling and bringing this stuff to life is a really key thing, I think, for, for senior people when you're looking to get that investment. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a great question. We have another question over here. Hi. Do I have to turn it on? Okay, sorry. Uh, Joanna Murphy, uh, Security Management and Governance at Shared Services Canada. I'm on Matt Davies' uh, team. So it's not a question for you, Matt, <laughs> but um, maybe it's more for Anne and Carl. So uh, in the Government of Canada, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, proofs of concept in the science space, um, primarily to create environments that are secure for uh, research and for scientists. Um, so while we've been doing a lot of those POCs and having great success, we also have, you know, I guess, more of your traditional scientists and mentality and culture with very cool equipment that are on-prem. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what your keys to success are for modernizing, you know, bringing that kind of environment that requires a lot of security? So we're talking about IP, uh, important information and research that the the, you know, the government of Canada needs to protect, but yet bringing it into a zero trust environment that is maybe a little bit more open. Sure, I, I think, yeah, I think that um, there's a couple things, right? So um, we you, you, protecting that environment is exactly what zero trust is good at because the whole concept of zero trust is, is it's just a really fancy name, right? As we all know, for, um, protecting your assets at every level and protecting your most critical assets more than other assets. So I think when you look at those assets, the question is, um, you know, the assessment of, 
of what kind of data, what kind of intellectual property, um, what, what is important in that that you want to protect, um, and then setting up the appropriate uh, system to do that. Right? So it's you know, obviously things like multi-factor authentication, encrypting your data and trust in, in, in transit and at rest, uh, and, and, and uh, using logging, all those best practices that we all know about. Um, but it's also educating your folks about how to most appropriately use the systems and access those systems and about um, what the risks are. Because, you know, we always say, at least I always say, that our users are, are our greatest risk, but they're also our best asset if they're well trained. Um, but more importantly, you, you, know, you commented about them being those assets being on premise. And there is nothing wrong with those assets being on premise. I think we have to look at the cloud as something in our toolkit. Those assets may most appropriately be on premise if that's the if that is the place where they're needed. For example, because you get tremendous amounts of data flowing back and forth, and it doesn't make sense to to uh, move them to the cloud, or um, they're not assets that could be supported by a public cloud, then you'd have to set up your own private cloud infrastructure. And then you question why I would bother doing that somewhere else when I could just keep it on premise. So there's a bunch of, of, of reasons there. Um, and also, you know, if this something is somebody else's core competency that they can secure better, then maybe you want to move it to the cloud. But if it's your core competency and you know how it works and you're best able to secure it, then you're probably better off keeping it right where it is. Um, but understanding is the most important thing. What do I have? What are my risks? How do I remediate those? And do my users all understand the system and the risks associated with it? Yeah, I completely agree with Anne's comments there. It's a risk-based approach for us, um, basically. And we're, we're lucky in some senses, again, that a lot of that work of, in UK government is through partner organizations and agencies. So, uh, and in that case, it's you know more reliance on the policy and the guidance and the guardrails that are in place. Uh, to make sure that once you've done the risk assessment, the kind of mitigating measures you're putting in place are appropriate for that level of data. Um, and then depending on the kind of security classification, then there's a whole other, you know, kind of world of pain to go through in terms of securing that and how you access it. So it is predominantly a risk-based balance with the business requirement and business need type approach for us, um, but encapsulated in that wider set of principles and transformation journey that you might be on. And there may be multiple tracks for that transformation. So you know, if it's core end use compute, you might just say, great, this is how we're, how we're going to approach it. If it's more business critical or a different, uh, different kind of context for the data and the application, uh, then you might have a, another track alongside it. So it's not trying to have a one size fits all approach to everything, nor do you want a massively divergent one. So that's a typical politician's answer there in the sense of it, it could be anything to anybody, right? But I think it's just do what's sensible and pragmatic, um, I think, for us. Right. Thank you. I don't know if Matthew or, or Matt, I know they weren't uh, specific uh, questions for you. If you have anything you'd like to add? The, the only thing I would add is for the science community, what I've noticed is that culture, there's a very, the culture of collaboration the scientists want to share. And I think the zero trust concept and what Joanna touched on, the applying proof of concepts to them to show them, hey, you can collaborate, you can leverage common tools, and you can do so in a secure manner that allows them to be able to act as the researchers that they, they want to do. And I, I feel for us, part of it was gaining that understanding with the science community, making sure that we can bring to the table, what are the things that help them? You know, whether it's a common set of tools, a common data repository, the ability to facilitate them to be able to interact freely. Um, it was tr really trying to get out of their way, but put technology and process and the people in place in order for them to be able to do what they want to do best. And, and I think it took a little bit of work when we started. Joanna didn't touch on that, but it wasn't the easiest thing to get going. But now, once you build up um, the, the trust with the community, the, the conversations get easier. And I think the collaboration and the, the cybersecurity posture of the folks is improved. But it, it involves that trust, that awareness, that discussions, high cyber hygiene, education. There's a big component of that that comes into play. Oh, next question, nope. sure. Yeah. All right, I'll go over here. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Um, Babakar, I'm working for uh, Health Canada as uh, an IT security guy. 
Um, I have a simple question, and I know Mr. Hoods talks, uh, talked about it earlier. It's regarding the investment that senior management has to do for uh, cybersecurity. I was just curious on knowing what was the strategies you guys use for talking to senior management and making sure that we are less reactive and try to be a more proactive in certain situations. So you talked about storylines and stuff, but what are the concrete strategies that you guys did? Yeah, so I think uh, anything and everything, uh, really, because you know, if you look at a board or senior execs that you've got to try and convince, they've, they're all coming from different starting places with different uh, levels of understanding. So there's been some sessions earlier on today about training and awareness. So we do a, you know, a set of themes every month where we, we put on different discussions and topics and we try and invite as many senior people as possible to come along just so that it's you know, kind of they're hearing the words and they start to understand it. We've got our audit and risk committees and other kind of normal structural type things that we can go through along with our standard reporting. So some of that gets flagged up in, in that, uh, in, through those mechanisms. But it's about building those relationships to Matt's point. I think it's, you know, that's key. It's, we are a people-based business in technology, right? This is about building that trust, building that rapport with people so you can have a conversation uh, and really getting a sense that you understand where they're coming from. So that's, that's a kind of one level. The other part I talked about uh, or mentioned earlier is this, the notion of continuous improvement and continuous investment. I had a conversation with one of my, uh, one of my bosses who said, well, look, Carl, there was no specific uh, investment for this particular cyber element. Um, we didn't get that from Treasury, so we're not going to be able to do it. And I said, well, there was no specific line item in our budget for electricity for the building or for water to come out the taps. So why aren't we treating this as a utility? Why isn't this just a, we need a level of investment and funding, otherwise we are gonna rapidly go backwards. So again, it's part of those continuous conversations. And if you can bring into life, you know, the kind of consequences of not doing something uh, as opposed to doing it, then you're really clear on, look, we've given you a set of options. Our recommendation is go with the good option that we, we kind of want. But if you don't, then just, you know, be wary. These are the types of things that could happen from that. So there's no one single answer. You know, I've worked with boards that some people like numbers and stats, other people like pictures, they like stories, they like to meet others and be convinced. You've just got to try and work out out of that morass of people that you have to try and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis what's going what's gonna to work for, for them as a collective. Um, but I think, you know, just being really clear on the consequences and the options that are available, because sometimes see, I, I think we're guilty of presenting the, here's the really wild, mad option. Here's the option you definitely don't want to go to. And look, there's our perfect option sat in the middle. So you've got no option but to do that. So, you know, in choice theory, have four or five or whatever the number is correct. So at least presentationally gives a sense that you've actually thought about viable options rather than the do nothing, do minimum, go with our uh, favored one. I just want to add, you know, one of the important points Carl has made, and there was speaking to them in their own language, right? You can't come into there and speaking about a cybersecurity language if they're people with no cybersecurity background. So, so talking about risks and benefits and in, in a language they can understand is hugely important. Yeah, I think when, when you're designing solutions of any type, if you're working on a cyber solution, which again is a continuum, it's not a moment in time, it's an evolution, it's a con constant diligence towards that, I think you have to define that common set of languages for senior management, right? You have to get buy-in, you have to have that organizational understanding of that, and you have to have where are we now and where do we want to go perspective on cyber, right? You, 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 you are going to be at a certain place, as you all know, but where do you want to get to eventually in terms of your, your proactive, your reactive nature to the opportunity? So I think it's building a common set of dialogue, a common set of languages, so everyone on the team is well ver as well-versed as you all are when you're having those conversations, if that's possible. So you can have informed, intelligent conversations with senior leadership, I think. So bringing it to life as well, sorry for us, it isn't just about the pure work context, both in that school's environment and in the departments that we run uh, tech across. It's about that blurring of boundaries, right? Would you be comfortable with doing these things in your personal life, with your bank account, with personally identifiable information, et cetera? So that it just becomes the norm. It isn't a, we, work in, we walk into work and then security is somebody else's problem because I've swiped in on the door and that's it. Um, I think, you know, it's just, again, part of that kind of continuous education exercise which helps everybody in both personal and and, uh, and their kind of work in life, just helps with the underlying narrative that 
this is a collective responsibility um, and we just have to be aware and keep moving forward. Uh, the, the only thing I would add is just building on the comments by fellow panelists. It is really about communication. And uh, just a little aside, so we just had a conversation about zero trust. I remember I presented zero trust concept to a group of folks and had somebody in the room put their hand up and say, why would we adopt a zero trust approach? Why would we not have like complete trust or full trust? Like why zero? That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. And then you realize you're trying to communicate to folks that may not actually know anything about the zero trust approach. And I, I think to pick up on Carl's comments, I often found it easier to explain, okay, think about somebody getting, you know, into your bank accounts or somebody breaking into your house, like, and explain it into terms that they will understand in English, not using all the cybersecurity terms because spend a lot of time, you know, distilling I, within our, our environment, we have a lot of terms for cyber concepts, then we overlay other terms to explain those terms in different terms. So for the person that just speaks English, it becomes very confusing for them to understand what we're actually trying to tell them. And so I think if you can bring it back to something that they do understand, whether it's their house security, whether it's their personal security, it tends to resonate a lot better than using all of the technical terms that we face every day to day. And we are quite guilty of that, aren't we? As, uh, as tech folk is <laughs> to slip into that. Um, just naturally, everyone's gonna gonna pick it up. It's like you know, years ago, somebody said, "How do you? How have you sold blockchain to your board?" Well, I, I haven't. Yeah, you know, I haven't sold it a for another reasons, but B, it's like you know, talk about in that context was around child safeguarding when I worked at Save the Children. It's like we need a mechanism of of understanding who is going to be on site in a disaster emergency situation. Uh, here are some things that we can do from a technology perspective. In the same way that you don't, you know, kind of have to explain HTTP or SMTP or anything else. So why why would people be interested in that at a board level? They're in, they're more interested in what is. What are you lot going to be doing to help me with revenue, with protection, with services, et cetera, whatever the context might be? So it's all, I think it's easy to slip into that kind of comfort zone, isn't it, of talking tech acronyms and other things to folk that kind of glaze over, like most of the audience are now when I'm rabbiting on. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. We have another question. Yeah, most of you already kind of have touched upon it in terms of the awareness and all that. So I'm just going to segue from that. And we all know that cyber is an expense. So it's always like for us, um, you know, convincing business or for that matter, I'll go a lever below rather than, you know, departmental security versus CIO or CTO will go to app dev world. So they want functionality within their realm of things and where we comes in as an expense. They're producing something for the business and our angle is from the expense. So how we take that higher level approach, bring it to a level down for especially app world, you know, IT, and at the same time, we can have all the awareness for a normal user, but for the IT, which is actually generating revenue for the business versus us as an expense have just a comment on it. So I'm going to just go back to a real world example, app dev world. So I'm going to just pick up on, so how many people here drive a vehicle? How many people here drive a vehicle without brakes? That's the, that's the point. So when I have discussions around, you know, I want to support application development because you're talking about a sec, a sec DevOps cycle versus DevOps cycle. The sec piece, oh, I don't really want to build the security in. I just need to get my development done and out. But if you don't take it in and we talk about, you know, catalyst for business transformation, you don't want to be rolling it out and then find out, oh, by the way, I didn't put brakes on the car. Yes, I can go really fast, but at some point I actually may want to stop the vehicle. And so that's the example I use to explain, hey, it's important to take security into consideration up front. And that's a real world example I use to explain why it's important. Yeah, <clears throat> I think there are enough cautionary tales out in the world now of, of what happens when you don't build in security. Um, that a rational person, now I recognize that in some cases our, our customer is not always rational when they want to get something done. Um, but uh, I think a, a rational user can understand uh, with a few of those examples brought to bear that 
uh, you may not want to be the next person, uh, the next company uh, to find yourself on the front page of the local newspaper or the national newspaper or on the evening news. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's, it's a relatively easy case if you sit down and have a rational conversation. Because the, the risk is to be like, well, how can you not understand this and to get upset? And you can't do that. You've got to step back and say, let me explain to you why this is important. And hopefully it's also a matter of, and here are our processes and policies and we don't skip this. Uh, and it's helpful if you have that piece as well, but, but you know, it's much easier to get someone on board than to just hit them with the stick that says you can't do that. Yeah, application developers never like, you don't want to infl or, or tell them how to do their job. You want to empower them with the right tooling and instrumentation and support to work those security paradigms into the things they're building whether that be an application, whether that be a process flow or whatever, you have to have, you have to give them options and you have to encourage them to adhere to these options or they may not get that funding. As you say, that expense will go, will be redirected to other organizations that will play by the rules. Um, we've made investments in open source and a lot of app developers are looking at the open source space and I think that's a terrifying mm -hmm. thing for a lot of you probably because the open source space also leads to insecure solution offerings if you don't take a considerate look at what you're doing and how you're leveraging those tools. So things like Spiffy Inspire and other algorithms and other tools and technologies you can use to help build up more robust applications in a security paradigm are really important to look to. So Yeah, that's an important point. You know, one of the things we do in the US government is we got a set of rules and we can say, oh, you need to follow these rules. But what we try to do is we set up processes that make it easy to get through that so if we set up a DevSecOps pipeline for them and say, use this and use our platform and do this, it's easy. Now you can go and do your own thing and not use our tools and not use our processes and it's going to be really, really hard and it's going to cost you money and time or you can come over here and do this. And so that is a way we, you can leverage those capabilities to make people want to follow the process and follow the rules. Yeah, I think that last point goes back to the kind of choice and consequences piece on it. And the same for investment, right? Again, just, you know, for us, it's about taking these away from being uh, something which is a huge choice, right? You don't, you're not going to say, no, we don't want to do anything with cyber at all. So within that, then it becomes a level of fidelity about how far do we want to go and what's the balance of risk and are we happy with, um, with the mitigation that we're, we're going to be taking by not investing. But the more that we can move into that non-negotiable it is just core, this is the cost of us doing business uh, cost element, then I think that's, that's easier for people to understand. Now, sometimes you've got that hurdle to go over of needing the initial investment to fix a particular problem. But then back to my earlier comment, I think the more you can flatten out that investment cycle to make it more of a continuous investment piece at a lower level, the easier it is. Then almost disappears back into the, this is our core cost, and then you get into the mm -hmm. usual, how do you shave off 10% every year because we've got to be more efficient and effective, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes. That kind of stuff. Um, but I think the more you can kind of move it down into that sort of space, uh, the easier it is to then, you can buy your own flexibility within that because you can make choices as a CIO then about what you might do with other platforms um, and where you might choose to target specific investment. I think if we're going back every time asking for, you know, really minutiae level of detail things, your problem of convincing and getting people to understand becomes inherently bigger, right? If you can sit down with a finance a CFO and say, hey, we need some investment in for our DevSec pipelines, blah, 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 they're going to sit and think, what on earth is, is this? I'd, I'd rather put it towards the front line, uh, go on with that. So I think, again, core of business, if you can articulate that and make sure that people understand that at a macro level, and buy yourself the flexibility to do whatever you need to do within it, then that's a, that's a better position to be in for me. So one quick add. Um, I made the comment about brakes, but think about how, <laughs> take that now and apply it to the fact that most moving vehicles gather so much sensor data that they're housing. And you think about autonomous vehicles, the software upgrades that goes into vehicles, all of that, it just exacerbates the need for making sure that there's security embedded in just the vehicles themselves. So. Very dated example on the brakes, but think about how much more evolved vehicles are now. Thank you. So I think we have time for one, hopefully two more questions. So I think I'll turn it over uh, to you. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask, 
in the eyes of your partners, external partners, how do you sell yourselves as being trustworthy and uh, uh, worth doing business with in terms of cybersecurity? Do you want me to take that first as the vendor on the stage? Is that, oh, is, do I, is that one? Your hand is high in the air. My hand is high in the air. I'll take that one first. <laughs> I mean, if you think about HP as a company, we've been around for forever, since 1939. I think we conduct ourselves with a certain level of ethics and quality of, of product. Um, I think we adhere to standards like NIST, if you're looking at cybersecurity foundational work. We try to develop products and portfolio solutions that, that we believe are very open and transparent in terms of how we come to market with them, right? Um, how do we convince you of that? I think our experience and our relationships and our and our products over the years um, are our best um, thing to bring forward. Um, so for us, it's it's proof in our reputation, our name, and, and our and these fine folks here, other than the cloud provider here, um, you <laughs> use our equipment and trust our equipment in terms of solution stacks themselves, right? So our our customers are our biggest advocate for us. Um, so from ours, it's our reputation, our product, our quality, and our openness in terms of how we develop and what we develop on your behalf. Slightly, sorry about that. That's right. Yeah. So, so we're a bit of an experiment in the UK government for running a shared service across the, the two departments. Um, now, it's largely because there was a machinery of government change in the UK, which basically means somebody decided that they wanted to split departments up and move responsibilities around. So uh, that's a slight quirk from that. but. Um, somebody thought it would be a good idea to, to experiment with the shared services piece and then scale that out if it, if it works. The advantage we've got is, I guess, that 10 other organizations that we didn't ask and we didn't have to sell to uh, came to us and said, look, we've heard great things about your platform and your service that you're offering. What's the cost? We gave them the cost and they said, really, is that the cost? That's half the price I'm currently paying. So we're like, great, that was a good good, quick win. And then it kind of grew out, out from there. So we don't actively go and sell our services to other departments or other agencies that, that exist within our ecosystem. They come to us. Um, so we're in a slightly slightly different position, I guess, than, than maybe other, uh, other countries that may be mandated that it's a central initiative um, or there are... Govcos or other organizations spun up from within inside government, which then go and compete and sell services. Um, so yeah, ours, but again, it's the same thing, right? It's about building that trust and reputation. No one's going to come to us if it, everything's falling over every five minutes and there's been loads of security breaches and data loss everywhere kind of thing. So that's why we're continually looking at maintaining those standards um, and positioning ourselves as equivalent to an external provider. So we're in continuous conversations with our strategic suppliers about how do you recognize us as an internal supplier in the same way that you would do a gold partner if you're Microsoft or whatever the other kind of equivalents are, which can get a bit of a frustrating conversation because certain, certain vendors basically say, well, you can only do that if you bring us revenue. We're like, well, we're not bringing you what we are because we're selling your services effectively. They're buying it from us. So, uh, but that, that kind of example is for us to be able to say, look, we are credible. We are investing in our people. We're investing in our continuous development of capability. So we can be trusted. It's just part of that kind of marketing with a small M um, kind of activity that we do in the UK anyway. All right. Um, I, we do have one more question. So unless you have a burning uh, comment. No. So last question over to you. Um, we have a panel that's international and public and private sector. So my question um, twofold. How do we enhance a public-private partnership, and how do we enhance collaboration in an in international forum? So I guess events like this are a great uh, a great start for doing that. We, within our digital team, our leadership team, we go and visit a different organisation every month, either within the public sector or or out, and we talk about we we have three aims for that. There is. How are they organized for delivery or how are their customers organized for delivery if that's um, if they're providing services? What are they seeing around innovation, both internally, whether that's their own product innovation or where are other markets and other sectors innovating? And how do we create connections? Because they're incredibly powerful things to have. So uh, in my team, we're responsible for knowledge and information management, records management across those organizations as well. The person who leads that for me, she's had, as an example, four or five conversations with Dell's European HR director on change management and how to impact change at scale across organizations. That was a byproduct of having collaboration. Um, 
and I can say, you know, hope I'm going to speak to Matt later on about what shared services in Canada does um, and how we might take some of that. But for us, it's just about expanding horizons. Uh, learning from other sectors, other markets. Half the time we say, don't talk to us about what government's doing. We want to know what's disrupting other sectors so that we can start to think about what that might mean for us going forward. But creating the connections is the most powerful thing in all of that. Any final thoughts to share? I think Carl hit it. Uh, we're all here, we're talking to each other. So. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, just uh, some quick conclusions is thank you to all the panelists. I think this was um, extremely informative um, and certainly a lot of takeaways, particularly on the importance of communication um, to all those who are impacted, which is, I think, everyone. Um, so thank you. Um, and thank you to all uh, the great questions as well. Um, so hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day.